Um, good. Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is Ben. Um, before we get started, uh, let me introduce you to my wife there. She picked up surfing about a year ago. Anybody doing surfing here? I had one person in the other room. Tried. Tried. Cool. Good. More than I did. Um, interestingly, she really likes it. And what she told me is that there's something like a surfer etiquette. So if you find a really good spot somewhere, really good waves, perfect weather, all that kind of stuff that you're looking for, there's one thing that you should not do, and that is telling other people about it, especially not on the internet. No, 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 you'll be shunned from the community, basically. So today, I'm trying to reverse that as part of the AnyLogic community. We don't want to be like surfers. We want to share the sweet spots. Uh, and today, I want to share with you a couple of sweet spots in AnyLogic that basically help you serve the wave of modeling a lot better. So AnyLogic, so in this workshop, we'll basically <laughs> there we go. In this workshop, um, we'll basically see lots of hidden gems in AnyLogic. By its nature, the software is a, is a little bit like an iceberg. So when you start out at the start, it looks kind of simple. You drag and drop a few things, and you see things happening quite quickly. But as you get more into it, you find that under each feature, there's a whole host of different things that you can learn about. And each of those, again, has another whole host of, of, of stuff below it. So it's really, really easy to get lost. You never really master the software everywhere. There's so much going on. I think it's on par with Photoshop or, or other really big software. There's so many features in there. Um, so my background is uh, I did a PhD in sort of aerospace design a couple of years back. And that's when I started learning any logic. So I had three years as a PhD student to really delve into the depth of it and sort of pick it apart. Uh, and most of the gems that I found that I'm going to present today are from that time. Um, since then, I've moved on working for a company called Decision Lab in London. We are a simulation consultancy, um, sort of building simulation models every day for aerospace, defense clients, uh, water industry as well. Um, so I'm using AnyLogic every day. I'm using those gems every day. And in my experience, what I, what I found learning the software is that you explore, lore, explore a little bit, you find something that's useful for you, you use it a while, and then you forget about it. And then you rediscover it a while, back, a, a while later. So the point for today is that for those of you who have used the software a while, I hope there are some reminders in here of, oh yeah, I forgot about that. That's really useful, actually. And for those of you who have never used it before, you will just see a couple of things that you should, should bear in mind, make a note of when you start your journey of actually exploring any logic. So who's never used, who's never touched the software before? A couple of people, OK. Who's sort of done a few months worth of work with it, getting to grips with it, getting frustrated? <laughs> um, and who's, who would consider himself like an experienced user, a year or more, something like that? Cool. Uh, similar to the other ones, to the other room. So a few people have never touched it. About half of you have done a bit, a bit and a third are experienced users. So. What we're going to do is we're going to build a model together. Um, but I will do this quite quickly. So if you haven't touched the software before, I don't recommend you try it on your laptop. You just get lost. I'll, I'll be too fast. So I recommend you just follow on the screen and take notes of the important gems that I point out to you. If you're more advanced, feel free to follow along. But it might also just be useful to follow what I'm saying. Um, so when I started preparing for this workshop, I sat down and sort of, yeah, what hidden gems do we actually have in any logic? And within a minute, I was able to write down 20 things. There are just so many things that popped to my mind. I was really surprised. There's so many little helpers and sort of tricks and tweaks in the software um, that I tried to organize them a little bit. So what we'll have is we'll have beginners <laughs> hidden gems. So for those of you who've never touched the software before, these are the ones to take a note of. These are the ones that are going to kickstart your learning experience. Um, we're going to have more advanced gems, so that's me surfing with my wife. Um, so th for those of you who have done the software a little bit, these are sort of the reminders um, to increase your productivity. And towards the end, we're going to briefly talk about some really advanced um, hidden gems that are there for you as well. Feel free to ask any questions all the time, um, just to manage expectations. While I build the model, I'm not going to explain why I do things and why I code certain things and stuff like that. I'm just going to build it, and I'm going to point out the, the gems to you. So this is not uh, a workshop of how to build a model. This is a workshop about learning and reminding yourself of those gems, all right? So 
I thought, what would be a good model to build? Something that you all can relate to, and that's this conference. So we're going to build a model of this conference, of you guys actually sitting there, listening to me, breaking out for lunch, coming back. This is what we're going to do. So we're going to use the pedestrian library. If you've never done that before, it's quite, quite nice and visual. OK, so let's get started then. We'll have three phases when we build the model. In the first phase, um, we'll basically just lay out the layout of the room where people sit. We'll create some pedestrian agents and they find their seat. That's all we're going to do. In the second phase, we will make them actually break out for lunch. So we'll all get up, queue somewhere at a buffet, get some lunch, have a chat, uh, and then actually go back to the seats. And in the third phase, we'll give you individual properties. So we'll split you into vegetarians and meat eaters. And you'll queue in a different behavior. All right? Any questions so far? Good. Let's get started then. So we'll really start from scratch. So we build a new model. Nothing, nothing magic here. But the first hidden gem already pops up now. So this is what you see when you create a new model. If you're a beginner, oh, can't track this one, um, you know, and, and make things snap together, click play, and you're really happy that something happens. Um, but there's already something waiting for you, which, you, which is easy to oversee. And if you pan up a little bit, you actually have two hidden objects there already waiting for you by default, and they're really useful. We're not talking about this guy today, but this guy is another hidden gem. I uh, would recommend that you explore him a bit advanced, but it's really useful. We'll talk about this guy. It's a, you know, it's a scale, it's kind of self-explanatory, but here you basically define the scale of your model. And because we build a model with a physical layout, this will be important for us. So let's have a look at this guy. Let's drag him into view a little bit more. Um, you can stretch the sky and really be flexible in how you define your scale. And I'm basically saying that sort of this width is equal to 24 meters. But don't worry about the details. The next sort of hidden gem or lesson that you should always follow is whenever you use a new object like this guy, first explore all the options that are there. And even for this simple little bugger, We've got the iceberg characteristics in the properties. There are several options here that are sort of give you very different um, ways of specifying how you want to specify your space. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to stick with this one, but I definitely recommend you explore properties every time. OK? Good. So we've defined the scale of our model. Let's start actually um, drawing the conference room. So it's just going to be a simple rectangular room. Nothing special there. We're going to have an, sort of an entry. Yeah, so it's just going to be this rectangular room with an entry area. We're going to have a target line. This is where the agents are going to start flooding into the conference. Uh, you see that later. And we create two seating areas. So this is where you guys are sitting, one here and one there. So I'm standing here, and you guys be put into sort of two areas where you sit, all right? OK, the next hidden gem. I said always explore the properties. That should be, that should be clear. Sometimes in the properties, you're blessed with a little button. And this is really useful. If there's a button, I recommend you click it. <laughs> it's a trial and error. That's how I did my PhD. That's how I got it. <laughs> um, so for this one, we've got a button that says attract us. But for other, for other objects, a button might say something different. So let's click this guy. And if you don't know what attractors are, I mean, what you have to do is you go into the help and read about what's an attractor. Um, in, in our case, we're going to use the grid. Again, iceberg, you know. You click on something, and suddenly there are more options and more options. Um, but we want to create your seats. So um, we're going to create 10 by 6 seats in this waiting area, the same in the other waiting area. Oops. OK, so technically what that means is if we send an agent into a rectangle, he's going to take a seat at one of those attractors. 
don't worry about that. Um, the important lesson is the button. Right. Specifically, each of those attractors has like a direction. Don't worry about it too much, but by default, they all look into that direction. So basically, you would all look into that direction, which is, which is pointless. I want you guys to, to face me. So obviously, for each of those, I could turn your direction manually, but that's a bit of a pain. So in any logic, like in most softwares, you can select, um, you know, select all things within a, within a uh, whatever that's called, within a rectangle. The hidden gem that is really useful is if you select several objects of the same type, you can change their properties at the same time. So I want to change the direction property of all those guys. If I select all of them, the orientation is saying, oh, multiple values, because most of them are looking in that direction. I changed one already. But I can override that and set it to minus 90 for all of them. So now you're all looking to me. The other cool thing is if you select um, only like, if I find them, if I only select a horizontal line of those guys, they all have different x values. x goes in that direction. So I can't change the x dimension. It wouldn't make sense because they all have different ones. But I can change the y dimension. So I could move them all up and down now. So there's a bit of intelligence behind what you select and what you can actually change. And if I select a couple of those guys and the target line, then again, I'll get a different set of properties that I can change. So it's context specific. And now I basically can't really change anything. I can't change those two guys. I don't have an orientation anymore because the target line doesn't have an orientation. So it always gives you like the minimum overlap between what you select. And that's quite useful to remember. Right, so we've done our sort of visual animation. Uh, what is missing now is the actual model. So we do that over here. And we're going to create a simple pedestrian model where we create a couple of uh, pedestrians at the target line, at the call of the inject function. <coughs> and what we want them to do after they've been created is we want them randomly to go to either waiting area, to the left one or to the right one. So we have a random kind of 50-50 choice after that, and then they either go to one weight area or the other one. Uh, we link them to the correct area. So don't worry about the specifics here. <coughs> we'll get to the next hidden gem in a minute. Good. So if I click the run the model now, Is that what you expected? Nothing happening. Any idea why? Why? Yeah, we haven't really created an agent yet, have we? Um, so let's just do that on the start of the model. So let's create 90 agents. See what happens now. All right, so we've got 90 agents. And they take their seat at random positions within the grid. So far, so good. Any questions up to this point? Very simple model. Right, so what you've seen me doing so far quite a lot is panning back and forth and sort of resizing windows and going here and there. Uh, pro tip is if you start out with any logic, get an external monitor. It's going to increase your efficiency by 50% at least. It is so useful. Um, I can't, you can't overrate it. A second monitor is super useful. What you can do is, you, what I usually do is I take the entire properties window and put it on a second monitor, because uh, that's where you do most of your stuff when you work with any logic models. So get a second monitor. If your boss doesn't like it, come to me. I'll, I'll, I'll make a calculation for him of how much more efficient you'll be and how, <laughs> how quickly that invest, investment will be uh, scooped back. Um, but anyway, so I've done all this panning and stuff, but it's quite painful, even if you, if you have lots of monitor space. So there's one little helper that's often overlooked in the presentation, and it's called the view area. So it's a view area object, which you can drag somewhere. And what that guy is doing is it's helping you to jump to certain places. So in the title, again, explore the properties. Um, you can actually name what this sort of area 
um, is. So you remind yourself, so you could uh, say this is my logic. And the cool thing now is that up here you've got a drop down list that now lists all the places that you've created. I've just created go to I've just created my logic so you can jump to that guy. You can by default jump to the point of origin and that's really useful. Now the cool thing is if you run your model you've got the same drop down list while you run the model so you can even while the model is running go to the logic and see what's going on or go back to the origin. So in a very simple way, without much coding, you can jump around the model and you can teach your client or whoever uses the model, you know, just click on that and you can jump around. It's, it's really simple. And again, the iceberg nature of any logic, there are actually much more options for that view area. So again, play around with that. It's a really useful little bugger. Right, so that's already phase number one. We've created our agents and they take a seat. Any questions so far? Okay, let's move on to phase two now. So people are sitting at their seat and what we want to do is we want to play Renee, who's organizing the conference and she's wa looking her watch at her, at her watch and saying, oh, it's time for lunch. Everybody should be breaking out for lunch. So what we want to happen is um, that we have a little button here where Renee can click it or you guys click it and people will go to like a buffet area. They're gonna queue there pick up some lunch, and then move over here to sort of eat their lunch and mingle. And as Renee is keeping um, watch on the time, if she clicks the button again, what we want to happen is that everybody goes back to the seat, no matter if they had food already or not. So that's what we're gonna do now. And the first gem that is an absolute beginner gem and super, super important is what you usually do is you, you build a model like I do as a beginner. You drag and drop things and you don't worry about it. And that's bad. You need to rename your objects. Every, every time you drag something over, you need to give it a good, understandable name. Sorry. My wife's just calling me about some surfing. Um, so, you know, if I drag this one in, it's named pet weight. The next one is named pet weight one. It's completely useless and you get confused very, very quickly. Um, I would recommend you use or adopt a naming convention actually. So just don't name things the way you want, but actually think a little bit about it. So let me share the naming convention that we use at my company and which we find quite useful for any logic. Um, if you go into the properties, you can rename all objects under the name thing. And what we do is we abbreviate the type of the object. So this is a pet weight object. So we just abbreviate that with PW, give it an underscore, and then we give it a descriptive name of what is this object actually doing. So this is the weighting on the left hand side. So I could just call that, um, or listening. Those that are listening on the left hand side, right? And the same with the other one, I call that listening on the right hand side. And we'll see in a bit why this naming convention is really useful when you do actual Java coding. Um, and I recommend you do it with almost all objects that you drag in. So better to do it too much than too little. So this is an area, I call it area A underscore right area, A underscore left area. Now, if I run the model now, There's one more thing to renaming things, and that is, you know, I've just retyped things and pressed enter and it renamed it for me. But what you should do instead is, whenever you rename something, remember to press control enter instead of enter. If you've done coding before, what's happening is it's doing a refactoring in the background. So let's have a look at this guy. Um, I linked this guy to be animated at A underscore left area. So that's nice, good stuff. But say I want to rename this A underscore left area a little bit later, so I call it left seats and press enter. Oh, this guy actually picked it up. <laughs> Normally, Java does not pick up those changes. So for Java to pick up those changes, you should press control space. Um, this is just a special case now because these things are sort of built in any logic things. 
do remember to press control space because it will mean that the renamed object is renamed everywhere in your model and you're not going to run into trouble. So it's extremely useful. Right. Okay, let's go on with the buffet then. Let's just draw a little buffet area. That's where the food is. And we'll use a service object for people to queue. So let's let me just rearrange that a little bit. So we'll have one queue for vegetarians. And another queue for our meat eaters. Can we have the meat eaters from the vegetarians? We can, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's the next phase. <laughs> right. Um, the next hidden gem is whenever you drag something in or edit things, I recommend not only check for properties, but also right click on the object that you've just created. Because often you get some useful context specific support. So if I right click on this line, for example, there's the usual copy paste, blah, blah, blah. But there's some really specific options that are quite useful. For example, adding points or you can turn this into a spline um, and do useful stuff with that line. Um, if I click on some other object, for example, on this one, right click, you'll see there are far fewer options. But there's just one option, select flowchart. So sometimes it's helpful if you have a huge flowchart, it will select the entire flowchart for you. It's really context specific, but I recommend always right click on something new just to see what options are out there. So let's just rearrange that a little bit, okay. Uh, we also need an area where our folks will eat their lunch. So it's another little area, we just call it A underscore lunch area. Okay, and now, again, we've just done the visual stuff first. Now we're going to actually implement the model. So we're going to use a pet service object where everybody who's leaving the waiting <coughs> will start the service. So he'll start queuing here and then actually grab his lunch. So we just link that to the service object that we've just created. We need to specify how long it takes for you to grab food. So how long does it take when you actually grab food at a, at a buffet? Uh, 20 seconds, man. I just <laughs> <laughs> so hungry, you got me something. OK, let's do it between 20 and 60 seconds then. Uniformly distribute it. Um, OK. And now we need that button that I was talking about. So if I run the model now, what do you expect would be happening? Everybody's waiting. Everybody's really anxious. That's because of the um, pedestrian library, so don't worry about that. Uh, but nobody's ever getting to lunch because we're not actually allowing people to leave those wait areas. So we're going to do that manually by using a button. So you as the user can actually decide when that happens. Again, explore the properties. There's a label, for example, um, which changes what's written on, on that button. We're going to say start lunch. And now we want to use some Java code. So the first thing that we want to do is, uh, well, these, everybody who's in here should be basically free. There's a, a free function. So Let's move on to actually coding in Java. So coding, you won't get around it until you, unless you do really, really simple models, you need to do some Java coding. And so some hidden gems to help you do that. So remember our nice little naming convention. Now you learn why it's useful to do it that way. Say I have 40 of those pet weight objects in my model. I've got a huge, big, fat model. And I can't quite remember which one I actually wanted. Um, I can just type PW and then press the only key combination that you need to remember in any logic and that's control space. It's the only one but you use it all the time. If you do control space it's giving you all suggestions that start with PW. And now that's why we name all our objects in that way because oftentimes you know that you need to access a variable or a pet weight object or something but you don't know which one. If you name things in this way you get a really nice list and then you can decide which one did I actually want. So we use this one and we want to free everybody.
And we're going to the next hidden gem, which is uh, advanced, I would say, but even for a beginner, you should remember it, that it's there. Can you see the light bulb on this screen? Who finds the light bulb? <laughs> really confused faces. What the hell is he talking about? Right, there is no light bulb on this screen, sorry, it was a trick question. There is. Oh wow, you're really good, actually. Yeah. I'm not sure either, to be honest. <laughs> Should be there. Let's assume it's not there, but good eyes. Um, all right. Can you see the light bulb now? So what I've done now is I've clicked into a code box where we're writing Java code, and as soon as I clicked it, there is a tiny little light bulb appearing there, and it's so small, it's so easy to to not see it. So as a beginner, as an advanced user, whenever you click into a code box, first check if there's a light bulb. Second, if there's a light bulb, more often than not there is, be a mouse superstar and try to hover over it. Oh, it's so difficult. There we go, because it's so small. And if you hover over it, you'll get a little cryptic message that is completely trying to put you off any logic for all days. In this case, it's saying, use self this element. And that usually is a call to have a coffee and just call it a day. What you need to know, what you need to get used to is what these cryptic messages are trying to tell you because they're super important. You can read about that in the help. Um, I've also written a blog post about it. In this case, this, it varies on where you actually click, so different messages, but in this case, it's saying, dear user, in this code box, you can use the keyword self to refer to this element, which is this button in this case. So when you do self, you can do something with the button. And this is what we want to do now. So, okay, I've, I've now learned I, there's a keyword self and I can do something with it. And in my case, we want to change the text of that button to end lunch. So logically, what is that is doing, as soon as somebody is clicking that, everybody will be freed from the waiting, so they go to the, to the lunch service, and then we'll change that text to, say, end lunch. So it just says start lunch until you click it. All right, let's see what that's doing. People taking their seat, time for lunch, everybody queuing, really good, not so good. Any, any idea what happened now? Again, this is the time where you have your second coffee and call it a day. It's like, oh God. If you're a beginner or even a, a medium advanced user, you must get used to error messages. You must not shy away from them. You must get used to those kind of cryptic messages and what they're trying to tell you. This is one of the more easy ones, unfortunately. Agent can't leave the port root.petservice.out. It has no connections. Oh, God. Again, it's one of the easier ones. Um, can't go through all the error messages, um, but you need to get used to what they're doing. But a hidden gem is that if you click OK, your model is still there. It's not working anymore. But there is actually sometimes a visual clue of where the problem is. So there's a little red dot there, and together with the error message, you might see that, oh, something is wrong there. If you know how a process model works, you, you immediately know, oh, okay, a guy doesn't know what to do now. He doesn't know where to go. So that's, that's the problem here. So sometimes you have visual clues in your model of where the error is. If you don't, you need to get used to those scary messages. So <laughs> it's a lot of red. Again, third coffee of the day, bye-bye. Um, it's the same error message here, and then lots of sort of Java scary stuff. If you're completely overwhelmed, get in touch with support and just send them a screenshot or something, they'll be able to help you. But the way I figured out those messages is, this one is a bad example. Most often you have lots of red lines, and you have these kind of blue links dotted around those red lines. So a beginner tip is, if you want to find out where the problem is, you click on the uppermost blue link. It's as simple as that. It's, uh, there's lots of stuff behind it, and I could explain to you why that is. But if you just remember to click on the uppermost blue link, you'll, you'll, be a lot, you'll, you'll have a head start, basically. So again, don't, don't get too scared by these guys. It's just a Java thing. Right, so we had a problem. We need to solve it. The problem was that after somebody grabbed their lunch, they don't know where to go we need to tell them to actually go to this lunch area. So let's have another uh, pet weight object. 
give it a good name. Eat. And now we get back to why naming your things is really useful. So now I'm trying to link where should they actually be waiting. Um, and in this drop-down list, it's telling me all the areas where they could wait. And because of giving them nice, good names, I know exactly which area I want them to wait, namely in the lunch area. So I can just click that. So if you're a good boy and you've done your naming conventions, you're in a good position, sometimes you are not and you've just forgotten naming. But then there's a little button next to it, which is a good little gem. If you click on it, you can visually select where you want them to wait. So everything is grayed out except for the objects where they could actually wait. So you could visually click on the lunch area, and it's going to select it for you. Right, so let's run the model again, see what's happening. Yeah, starting lunch, people queuing, and now people go into the lunch area and actually eat their food, and everybody is really anxious to get food. Good. The next step in the phase that I was talking about is that when A wants to end lunch, time's up. Guys, we need to hurry. Even if you haven't eaten yet, everybody needs to move back to their seats. So many good presentations coming. So when you click on that button again, what we want to do is that everybody moves back to the seats now. So we're going to do a little bit more coding in that button. Um, and we're going to use an if-else function. So let me just type that quickly. Yes? Yeah. It's basically referring to this button. So when I type self dot, I get all functionality that this button can do. For example, changing its own text. What you usually do these kind of things for is, for example, in a pet service object, you know, you've got pedestrians moving through there. And sometimes, whenever somebody enters that block, you want to do something on every person that enters the block. And then in one of those code boxes, you know, in the properties on enter, what should happen when somebody enters? Again, there's a little light bulb. You hover over it. It says use self or pet. So what you need to know is that you can here use two keywords, either self or pet. It doesn't give you any explanation what these are. You just need to know that, and it's in the help file. Self would refer to that object, whereas pet would refer to each individual pedestrian going through. So if you want to change the color of each pedestrian, you type PED dot and then change color or something like that. So that's, that's the use of the keywords and the light bulb. Um, right, so let's type some nasty Java code, and I'll tell you in a second how to get rid of that. So what we're doing now is at the start of the model, if somebody clicks this button, we're basically saying, if, if this button says start lunch, which it, which it does at the start of the model, then execute the code that we just had. So we're basically starting lunch. And we're changing the text to end lunch. So the text changes once you click it. If you click it again, then the else bit will be executed. And in the else bit, we're changing the text back to start lunch. So we've got a, like a back and forth switch. And what we want to do when we end the lunch is we want to tell everybody that is having lunch, like eating their lunch or actually still queuing, to want to tell everybody to move back to their seats. Is the self, uh, the same as a no, no, it's not. It's a good question. So this is a, it's a Java keyword. If, if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. But in this case, if you type this here, you would refer to the main agent, the entire main object but you want to just refer to, to the button in this case. Yeah. So you need to be careful. Um, right, let me quickly type that. Okay, so if we've clicked the button before and we click it again, we execute this code. And what this code is doing is in the pet service object, this one and the PV underscore. Um, eat, we are canceling every agent that is in there. And that's another hidden gem if you're interested in the process modeling library. Lots of people often oversee that. They build process models like that. 
but they forget that some objects have additional exit ports. So there's an entry port here, an out port here, but there's actually another out port there. And sometimes you've got two at the top or even three. So remember those, check out the help file of what they're doing. In our case, these two are sort of emergency exit ports. So if there's a fire alarm or something, or if, uh, if Renee wants to say that everybody needs to go back to their seats, we're gonna, with the console all function, we're basically saying whoever's in there should leave via those exit ports. So now we need to connect those exit ports to where people should be going. And we want them to go back to their seats. So what we're doing is we put them back into that 50-50 split and they basically decide if they go into the left or right hand seat. Uh, if you don't know about it, so I've got an error in my model now while compiling, it pops up. It's always good to just double click on it. That's a beginner's hidden gem because that's going to take you exactly to where the problem is. So don't need to read the message. You just double click on it and it will get you that. So what's it saying? Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot something. Okay, people are taking a seat. We click on the start lunch button. We've seen that before, people queue. People start having lunch in there. The button has changed to end lunch. So if I click it now, the new functionality will be executed that everybody, even those who are still queuing and really hungry, Rene is absolutely ruthless in saying, no, you need to go back. So if I click it, everybody's going back <laughs> to their seats. It's like, oh, I'm so hungry. And if you click start again, they queue again, but Rene is a mean person, so. She said, everybody back. <laughs> Any questions so far? Okay, let's move on to the next hidden gem. Uh, more advanced, but really useful. We've written Java code. Some of you might not be familiar with it. It might look really ugly if squiggly lines, normal brackets, it's all a bit, a bit of a mess. Um, normally, your algorithms are much more complicated than that, so it can get all be a bit overwhelming. And then you have the problem that the client sees the model, you show it to him, you click the button and the client says, uh, don't believe that, how, how do I know what's going on under the hood? And you show him the code and he says, oh, I can't be bothered, too complicated. So AnyLogic gives you a nice visual construct to visually construct algorithms like that. Uh, and it's heavily underused, so I recommend you get used to it and start using it, it's called an action chart. Um, and the way it works is you just drag in an action chart object Give it a nice name, we call them AC underscore, and then what they do, start or stop lunch. Uh, doesn't look good. Okay, and then you can drag in additional objects, a for loop, a while loop, typical programming constructs. Um, if you've done coding before, they should look familiar. Uh, and what we had is an if else statement. <coughs> And in an action chart, you do that with a decision block where you specify a condition. And if that condition is true, you go down the right-hand branch. If it's false, you go down the left-hand branch. So what we do is we just copy that condition that we already specified. So if the text in the button is equal to start lunch, then whatever is in the true branch should be executed, otherwise the other branch. The thing to look out now is in this code box, we don't, have a, we don't have a little light bulb. Sometimes happens. And that means that this code word self that we used before is not valid here. It's going to throw an error. In this case, any logic doesn't know what you mean by self. But we want to get access to that button because we want to get its text and check if it's equal to lunch. So we need to access the button by its proper name. Um, in this case, it's just called button. That's just the name of this object. And now we've got a proper condition. And this looks, doesn't look too nice, so you don't want to show this to your client, do you? So each action chart object has a really nice little feature in, in its properties, which is called label. And there you can just um, type anything you want. And it should be a very brief description of what's actually going on in that, in that box. So if I type start lunch question mark here, I know exactly that this is a condition that checks if I should start lunch. If it's true, I do something, if it's false, I do something else. 
And that's also really helpful if you write some code and in two months time you go back to your model and you have no idea what this was all about. With this you are forced to document your code in a coherent, easy to understand manner. If you just type code like that, it's very easy to get, just type it and, and forget about it and do it quick and dirty. Um, but with action charts, you're forced to make it look nice and, and understandable. So we've got our condition. Um, then we want to execute code if that condition is true. So we just copy and paste the code into this code box. Again, we need to replace the self with button. And then give it a nice label. For example, all go to buffet. And you can rename, uh, resize those things so it looks nice. We do the same thing with the false branch. <coughs> Replace the self and give it a nice description. Everybody back to work. Right. So that now means that we don't need this ugly code anymore. We've actually recreated it in a much nicer way. So we can get rid of this. And in order to execute it, we basically just call it. So it's AC code complete. And it lists all everything that starts with AC. And at the very top, we've got that function that we just created. So it's writing the code for us. So functionally, in the model, nothing has changed. If I click the button, people do their stuff. And it's just as before. But the nice thing is you even have that visually now while the model is running. So if your client says, yeah, but what's happening when you click this uh, button in your, in your meeting, you don't need to go back to this ugly any logic interface. Well, it's not ugly, but I mean, it's technical. <coughs> you can just show it to him while the model is running. And you can talk him through of what's happening. And it's much easier to follow, especially for complex algorithms. So that's an advanced hidden gem, but it's really useful. We make use of it all the time. Good. Let's move on to um, a similar area. So we've already moved towards documenting your model in a nice way. Super, super important. Let's explore that a little bit further. Who's written a model or a piece of software before and completely never figured out two months later what it was all about? Really, really struggle. It's such a common problem. When you, do, when you build your models and don't document them, I can guarantee you in two months' time you have no idea what this was all about. So you need to be careful of documenting your model. The action chart is a good way forward to documenting an algorithm. But any logic helps you go one step further. Every object that you drag in, and literally every object, in its properties has always a description tab at the bottom. And in there, you can actually write something. So you can write what this action chart is all about. So you could say um, starts or stops lunch depending on the button. So this is a good start. So when you, when you revisit your model in a couple of weeks um, and you don't know what this was about, you always check just in the description of what, what this is about. Useful. But it goes further than that. This box is linked to what's called Javadoc. So any logic is Java. And if Javadoc doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry. But it's basically a framework for documenting software in a good way. So what you can do is some, you can use some special features down there. For example, uh, you can use some special keywords. For example, uh, at author. And with this, you can basically sign your work. So if I've created this algorithm, what we do in our company is we force our developers to sign their work. And it's just to be able to, in two months' time, actually figure out, if I look at this model, who the hell did this? And then I see, oh, it was myself. OK, that's why it's crappy. Fair <laughs> enough. But it's really useful. I mean, it's not to blame people, but it's useful to, to get help and, and get the right person to explain to you what was going on. Um, there are a couple of other keywords. There's an add since keyword, which basically helps you to specify when you did it. Also extremely useful. Um, can be a date, can be a version number. And there are a few more. So, what I recommend you do is you Google Javadoc keywords and you'll get the full list of those. Now you might wonder, well, why do you have to write this, this at author thing? It looks, looks a bit awkward, doesn't it? Um, but there's a good reason for that. First, it's a transferable skill. This is how all Java coding and documentation is done. So it's just 
a useful thing. It's an industry standard, so, so better get used to it. Um, but also, if you write code, um, ah, sometimes it doesn't work. And you can't quite remember what a function was, was about. You usually start typing some code. You do the code complete. It gives you a list of all the things. And then if you hold on, if you just stay there for a second, you see that little help window here. And in here, it's now actually showing you what you've written in that description tab. So this is a more advanced function. Uh, let me try if I can dig up the one that I've done. Yeah, it's sometimes a little bit flaky with action charts, but always works with other objects. Well, we'll get to it. Oh. There we go. So sometimes it doesn't pop up, but if you try a second time, it, it usually pops up. So this is what I've written, starts or stops lunch, but then you get this nicely formatted way of when was it done and who did it, and again, there are other keywords that, that would pop up if you use them, like arguments or what the function returns and all that stuff, if that means something to you. So I recommend, um, yeah, let's use that actually. I recommend you get used to documenting everything that you drag in. Mm -hmm. And a professional or more advanced tip is when you write what this is doing, you should not focus on what it is doing. You should focus on why it's doing it and where it's called from. So the what is basically inherently in there already. So if I type, if I say, well, this is um, checking if we should start lunch and then it's all go to buffet or everybody back to work, I'm just duplicating work. It's, it's completely wasted effort. You should write why you created this function and where it's called from. It'll be much more useful for you in the future to understand the model because the what is already there. But that's a bit of like how we should document models. Right, um, one thing that people often oversee is, I've said the next feature we're moving to phase three now is that we want people to queue based on if they're veggie or meat eaters. So what I've done is I've prepared some external data for our 90 people, um, so one to 90, and they're either a meat lover, a veggie, and they also belong to specific companies. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna import that data into the database. That is another hidden gem. Lots of people are not using the database, but it is really quite useful. Um, super easy to do. Let's just import that one table. Okay, and now we've got our data in the model. So that's a good start. So we've got all that data. We've got the different columns. That's really nice. Um, and we've got this dimension, meat eater or veggie. And in our model, we say there's nothing in between. It's either or. Um, so what you should do in these kind of simple situations is you should create a, an explicit dimension of that using an option list. So an option list is a, a way to introduce those specific dimensions into your model and make sure that nobody is ever a veggie and a meat eater. So an option list is a very simple thing. We name it ol underscore food preference. And there we specify the dimensions that are possible, veggie or meat lover. Now we've got those, this, these two dimensions on our model. And the hidden gem now is that many people don't know about is in our data now, we, these are strings, but we can map that to our new dimensions. So the column food preference in our data table is currently a string, but we can override it and say, this should now be actually a food preference. If I do that, it's basically overwriting the data and now if I want to change it, I can only change between veggie and meat lover. So it's, really e it's, it's a really powerful way to avoid confusion or typos or things like that. Veggie with one G or things like that, which are really easy to slip in. If you know about specific dimensions that your model has, like sex or age groups or whatever, go for the option list. Really useful. The property of the agent? Uh, not yet, but we'll make them into a property of the agent. So yeah, let's go one step further and actually create um, agents. Um, so it's just the usual wizard. Uh, we call them attendee. 
make sure that they're used as pedestrians, give them a nice <coughs> animation, and then we actually create those parameters that we had in the, in the data. So B food preference. This is again an advanced hidden gem, but in the, when you specify a parameter, you can make it you know, a, a, an integer, a double, a string. Any logic also gives you predefined dimensions, which are really useful. So length, speed, acceleration. If you deal with these normal physical dimensions, any logic um, allows you to do that and avoid mix-ups of units. So if you add a speed to a length, it's going to tell you, oh, you can't do that. that. That's physically not possible. And if you have one speed in meters per second and another in miles per whatever, um, any logic will take care that everything is done in the correct way. So it's quite powerful. And you can also say our food preference should be of the type optionalist. So it should either be vegetarian or meat eater. And we also... Create the company, which is a string. Finish that. So now we're going into agent-based dimension. We've got an attendee agent with specific characteristics. And the next step is that we want to load them from the database. So right now, we're just creating 90 dumb default pedestrians without those characteristics. We actually want to create those attendee pedestrian agents with characteristics from the database. So we just do that in the properties. Again, don't worry if, you, if that's too complex at the moment. We'll come to the next hidden gem in a second. We'll store all agents in here. Right, and we take that one away. So what we want to do now is we want to loop through our data table and for each row create one of those agents that have that specific data. And that's the next hidden gem that people often forget. This has to be done with Java code. There's no way around it. Um, and it can get a little bit messy, but any logic is there to help you. So let's say we want to create those agents on the startup. If I click into the code box, there's a tiny button up here saying insert database query, and that helps you actually define something from your database or load something from the database. So again, iceberg, lots and lots of options here. Do figure them out. We want to iterate over all data entries in the data table and then do something with each, um, with each entry. So it's written that code for me now, which is really useful, and you need to amend that. So I've um, pre-written that, so I'll just copy and paste it. So I'm now amending um, the code. I think I need to, a couple of errors. So what we're saying is for each row in the database, we want to create one agent. We want to be able to um, have a handle on that guy. And then we're going to set the, um, the three parameters for each agent based on the database table that we currently have. Let's see if that fixed things. Oh yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> Almost there. One last one. Right, so don't worry about that. Good, so first thing, first difference is that we've now created those specific agents with their own animation that we defined when we set up the agents. So we now see these are not the default dump pedestrians anymore. These are our cool individual pedestrians. 
Um, and then we can actually check each individual one out. So we're looking at the first pedestrian now with index one. He's a meat lover. He works for GE. Um, the second one is different to him. And the third one as well, we've got a veggie and IBM. And the way I've set up the data is that 25% are veggies, 75% are meat eaters. Hopefully that's realistic. So the last thing that we want to do is in the service object, we're going to change um, the queue choice. So we're not using the shortest queue, but each agent will basically say, oh, I'm a meat eater. I should join the meat eater queue. And there's one more gem before we finish. And that is um, in this line, we basically are supposed to specify the queue. Again, there's a tiny little light bulb, self and pet. Um, and this line does not allow you to write several lines of code. It just wants one line. And there are good reasons for that, but it's too technical. But sometimes you have to write an if statement in one line of code. And you can do that in any logic and in Java in general. Um, so we're using the keyword pet in this case, because that refers to each pedestrian that goes through. Uh, -dip -dip. Then we're checking what is his food preference. Is it equal to um, veggie? And this is now where the power of the option list comes in again. I'm not saying is it equal to string veggie, and I'm introducing lots of po possibility for error. I'm using code complete. I'm, I'm always will be fine because there's only veggie or meat eater. Um, if that is the case, we want to use a specific queue named queue line. Otherwise, we'll use queue line one. Uh, these refer to these two lines here. One is called queue line, the other line, queue line one. We didn't rename them, so we are now stuck with this ugly, uh, difficult bit. And we've got an if statement now in one line of code, which is quite useful. So it's saying, if this is true, question mark, then use this one, else use this one. So final bit. So let's start lunch. Long line with the queue. Oh, meat eaters are getting crazy. And there should be, yeah, there's a very short line for the vegetarians. So they are done quite quickly. OK. Yes? So this, uh, these agents have state. The state doesn't change. Um, they have a characteristic, let's say. It's not a state. The state is a very specific thing in, in agents. They have a characteristic of either being a meat eater or a vegetarian. It's like a label that's on you. Right. Um, let's spend two or three minutes for the advanced users on some advanced hidden gems. Um, one of them is we've created our attendee agent. Let's assume you're working for a consulting company that builds these conference pedestrian models all day long. Super big market for it. Um, and somebody has created the attendee agent. One of your employees has created this attendee agent. And it's a super complex agent. It's really, really quite clever and quite realistic. And another client comes and says, oh, can we have a model as well? And obviously, you don't want to recreate that, that bugger from scratch. You want to reuse things uh, in your company. So what you can do is you can create a library, <coughs> if, you have the, if, if they have the professional license, that is, where you give it a name. And you can basically say, my attendee should be part of a library. You can export it into a specific file that you send somebody, another AnyLogic user. Um, he can import it into his AnyLogic instance. And what you'll have in the end is you'll have a new library here. So you can just add the <coughs> file that the other guy sent you. Oh, doesn't like it. <coughs> and what we now have is a new entry here, which is your library. And it has this one little object there. And you can now drag and drop that into new models. So it's extremely powerful for reusing objects uh, within your company or with colleagues and sharing, sharing intelligent blocks. So you could just drag and drop it in there. It's now a black box, so you can't enter, edit it anymore. But the, the characteristic that you defined is in there. And it's working. You just need to define the, the interfaces to it. So that's quite useful, but fairly advanced. Sometimes it is useful when you write some code to see 
the code that is written around it. So whenever you drag and drop something in any logic, all that is really happening is that any logic is writing code for you in the background and giving you a visual representation. And sometimes you want to see that code. So when you're in a code box, you can click Control J. So when you want to see what's actually going on around there, you click Control J and you actually see the pure Java code. You can't edit it, but it's sometimes useful to see what's going on in the background. So that is, that is really advanced, but quite, quite useful. I, I think, I hope there were some useful reminders for some of you, some useful introductions for the beginners. Um, and you made, you made some good notes. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the conference. Thank you.